Thank you, Clayton. And uh, I have, have decided in, in view of the circumstances of uh, particularly the group from Wycliffe uh, to speak uh, as slowly and as a monotone manner as I possibly can <laughs> so that you'll get it, be able to catch up on your sleep. Uh, I feel free, pe- feel free to, uh, to use your time as you would uh, today. Well, it's a pleasure to continue our trek through uh, the events that constitute our redemption. As we've seen, it's not only in the atonement, Uh, itself where Christ's uh, saving work is displayed, but also in his ascension and in the sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. All of these events are not merely exclamation points. They are just as constitutive of our salvation as the death and resurrection of Christ himself. And uh, so what I want to focus on today is that transition between the Ascension and Pentecost, uh, as Clayton announced, with, with Jesus' uh, announcement that it is better that he go. And as we turn to uh, Pentecost from the vantage point of the Ascension, uh, we begin to see, I hope we'll see more clearly from uh, this morning, just how essential the Holy Spirit is not just to the application of salvation, but to the very salvation that Christ has won for us. Just as our culture doesn't quite know what to do with uh, Jesus' resurrection when we start talking about it, as I focused on yesterday, uh, people are completely baffled when you bring up the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly when they were raised uh, with the old King James Uh, language of Holy Ghost. Uh, They're more likely to think of uh, Halloween than Pentecost. Uh, And it's all the weird stuff. You know, if you're into the weird stuff, then the Holy Spirit is the one for you. Uh, The Holy Spirit is all about the extras. Sure, we need Jesus, but we also need the Holy Spirit. Sure, we need uh, the atonement, but we also need the spiritual gifts. Sure, we need Uh, the gospel, but we also need uh, other revelation. You know, the Holy Spirit becomes the placeholder for all the extras. So the Christian world divides between those who like the extras and tend to associate the Holy Spirit with those extras, and then people who don't. If you're into that sort of thing, good. Go with the Holy Spirit. If not, at least you have Jesus. (laughs) Right? Am I right? Isn't there a division often in the Christian world that's like that? And what gets lost in the process is 90% of what the Holy Spirit actually does. Because basically, those of us who don't believe in the extras don't have much to say about the Holy Spirit. And then those of us who do believe in the extras spend all of our time talking about the extras and not the 90% of what the Holy Spirit is actually doing. And so that... That, that's what I want to focus on here in this talk. All of the works of the Godhead come from the Father, in the Son, through the Spirit. That's an old patristic maxim, a maxim of the church fathers that was used again and again. The Protestant reformers picked it up. All of the works of the Godhead proceed from the Father, in the Son, by the Spirit, just as the Son proceeds from the Father. And the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So in their works, all works proceed from the Father in the Son by the Holy Spirit. And so the Father is always the source of every good and perfect gift. The Son is always the mediator. And the Holy Spirit is always the perfecter. The the Holy Spirit is identified from Genesis to Revelation in all of the works of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who who brings God's work to completion, whatever that work is. So the first thing we have to avoid is the temptation to think that the Father is the Creator, the Son is the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit is the Sanctifier. Actually, the Father 
is the creator in the Son by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Actually, Christ is the Redeemer who is sent from the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And sanctification comes from the Father in the Son by the Spirit. In every work, it's not that they do different works, it's that in every work they do it differently. They don't do different works. They, they act differently in every work. They have different roles that are consistent with the distinctive uh, character of each person. And so the Holy Spirit is especially the one who, who uh, brings it all home, as it were. The Holy Spirit is the one who turns a house into a home, a chaos into a cosmos. The, ho the Holy Spirit is associated especially with three things. You know, preachers always have to reduce things to three things. Uh, perfection, judgment, and beauty or glory. Perfection, judgment, and beauty. The Holy Spirit is associated in Scripture with perfecting all of God's works, judging, bringing judgment in all of God's works, and arraying in beauty and glory all which God has made. We see this, first of all, in creation, and I, in the, the, the uh, breakout session, uh, I'm going to uh, be going into greater detail, but I felt like I had to at least hit some bullet points before we get into our Lord's uh, upper room discourse. First of all, you know, the Holy Spirit and all of these activities of, of perfecting, the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters in creation. And the Holy Spirit shows up in Genesis 1-2. If you, if you are teaching a course on the Holy Spirit and you start with Acts, you're too late. <laughs> you're too late in the story. Yeah. Genesis 1-2, that's pretty early, the second verse of the Bible. He comes in the first act of the play. And what is he doing? He's hovering over the waters in creation, again, turning a house into a home. The, the tohu vabohu, the confusion and void, is not, uh, as in the pagan myths, a divine evil chaos. It's just unformed matter. It, it, it's really, I wish we had time to go into this, but it's really amazing how the biblical story naturalizes nature. It's neither divine nor demonic. It's just water. In chaos... <laughs> in whatever form you want to, it's not yet formed, not yet separated from the land, and all. It, it, but chaos, not the chaos monster of the Enuma Elish. It's just water. Water that the Holy Spirit cherishes and is going to turn into a, a home for fish <laughs> by his fructifying energies. The picture is that the Holy Spirit is, is both cherishing the oceans and the land and by spreading his wings is actually fertilizing <laughs> the seeds that the Father has planted in his word, the Son. And so there is the fiat word, let there be and there was, creating something out of nothing, ex nihilo, fiat creation. But then there's another word that God speaks in that creation narrative. In the same chapter, chapter 1, we read not only let there be and there was, let there be light and there was, for example, but we also read let the earth bring forth its fruit. Let the seas bring forth, let the seas teem. Uh, actually, in the Hebrew, let the, let the seas swarm with swarms of swarming things. That great. Uh, let the sky, you know, so in other words, what God is saying is, let what I have planted in the cosmos by my word in my son become fruitful through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who fructifies those seeds and spreads his wings over uh, that which God has spoken into being to make it fruitful. And then the Holy Spirit comes in the next act after the fall. 
He comes in the spirit of the day. Now, ruach there can mean wind or it can mean spirit. For some reason, the translators have rendered, most of our, the translators have rendered it cool. So this is what we learned probably most of us growing up. After Adam sinned, uh, Adam and Eve heard the Lord in the garden walking in the cool of the day, right? Sounds like a commercial, you know, a, a, a white wine commercial. Um, it's the cool of the day and they're walking. It makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. What it says is they heard the voice of God and they hid themselves from God in the cool of the day. Now, what's the point of that? It's a beautiful, lovely day with a nice breeze and they just fled the dangerous presence of God. It doesn't make any sense at all. And so some uh, scholars have suggested the way this should be translated is that he came in the spirit of the day, capital S, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is associated with the day of judgment. And the Holy Spirit, who hovered over the waters to cherish them and to fructify them, and also to add his blessing to the fathers and the sons, it is good, is now coming into the courtroom to arraign the couple and to pronounce their judgment. Throughout Scripture, as we'll see in the next, uh, uh, after, after the break, uh, those who are, who are in this session, throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is associated with judgment. You know, so much for the kind of cuddly picture we have of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's as dangerous as the Father and the Son if you, you, know, if you, if you aren't coming through the mediation of Christ. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit prepares a body for His Son throughout the history of Revelation. The prophets speak in the Spirit, and they pronounce God's judgments on Israel in the Spirit, just as John is taken up in the Spirit on the Lord's Day when he has those visions recorded in the book of Revelation. The 70 elders under Moses are appointed because Moses finds the task of leading the people so burdensome, they keep putting him on trial, which really means putting God on trial. And so God says, we'll appoint 70 elders. And by the way, keep that in mind for the 70 who are uh, sent out uh, and come back to Jesus and report that even the demons are subject to them and they're in his name and so forth. So 70 elders are appointed. And there are a couple of people who weren't in the assembly prophesying in the Holy Spirit, but they're prophesying in the camp. And Joshua was a little worried that this didn't follow the, the exact form of, of what God had said. And so he was careful and concerned to follow everything God had, had told him. But, but Moses says uh, to his associate pastor, hey, relax, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. That's what would really relieve me. <laughs> what would really relieve me is if the Holy Spirit would be put, would be placed on all of the people of the Lord. And then uh, you have the, the anticipation of the servant who will be spirit endowed in the prophecies of Isaiah, already in Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9. Again, the servant will be dressed for judgment and justification, and it is the Spirit who will clothe him for that. And then, of course, in especially in Isaiah 42, 1, uh, the, uh, Lord ha the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, and that's, of course, the text that Jesus appeals to in his first sermon when they want to throw him over a cliff. They knew what, that, what it meant by Jesus quoting Isaiah 42, Verse 1, I am that spirit-anointed Messiah. Then Ezekiel 36, prophesying the outpouring of the Spirit. The Spirit evacuates through the eastern gate of the temple, 
Just as the Spirit left the eastern gate of the temple in Eden, and Adam and Eve were cast east of Eden. And then in chapter 43 of Ezekiel, the Holy Spirit is prophesied to return through the eastern gate, as it were, into a, a better end time sanctuary made without hands. Glorious end time sanctuary. And then finally, after the exile, Joel 2, Haggai 2 particularly, uh, uh, prophesy this great day when the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh, men and women, young and old. And this Spirit will fill a new end time temple that will be far more glorious than any temple that has preceded it. And so then when we look at the incarnation, with all of this in mind, the Holy Spirit associated with perfecting all of God's works, judging and arraying in beauty and glory, uh, we see all of it come to especially to a head in the incarnation uh, of our Lord. The Holy Spirit will come upon you so that what is born of you will be holy, no less than the Son of God. What an amazing announcement. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Mary doesn't understand what on earth she's just been told. What kind of announcement is this? I just got up and a giant angel is speaking to me, terrifying me, and then uh, astonishing me with these words that, that though I'm a, a virgin, I will conceive, and the, the person I will conceive is no less than the second person of the Holy Trinity. Uh, how will this happen? And Gabriel says, it's enough for you to know that the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. He will come upon you. And episkiaze, the verb that's used there for overshadow is the same verb used in Exodus when you read about the Holy Spirit filling the tent of meeting, filling the tabernacle or covering the people in their wilderness wandering to the promised land, the pillar and the cloud. The Holy Spirit is associated with that cloud, with the wings of cherubim and seraphim bumping into each other, just filled with glory and beauty. The Holy Spirit is the, is the charioteer of that cloud. And so now, Gabriel says, you don't understand all of this, but the Holy Spirit will overshadow just as he fluttered, hovered over the waters of the chaos, of the nothingness, of the tohu vabohu, with no life in it, and fertilized it. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit will overshadow the lifeless waters of Mary's womb and bring a new creation out of nothing. First, the Holy Spirit had to create faith in Mary's heart. That was the first miracle <laughs> of the incarnation. To create faith in Mary's heart, that was as much of a miracle as the incarnation. And then Mary said, well then, let it be done to me according to your word. Isn't that amazing? What a great response. Not, okay, well, let me get to work. Let it be done to me just as you have promised. May exactly what you have said happen to me. And yet, you know, the, the, the incarnation itself, the conception of Jesus was ex nihilo creation, out of nothing, let there be light, and there was light. But the gestation and birth were normal. That's why we don't talk about, really technically about the miraculous birth of Jesus. There's nothing miraculous about his birth. The miracle is in his conception. Uh, he, he really was carried along for nine months. And, and Mary's womb was not a container. She was nurturing and feeding the Lord God <laughs> in her womb. She gave her DNA to the Savior of the world. And yet, and yet he was no less than God himself. He was assuming our nature. And so he was born in the ordinary way. In fact, Luke 2, 40 and verse 52 tell us that uh, he actually grew in wisdom and stature, and in the respect 
of uh, all the people in the community. He grew in wisdom and stature. He learned obedience, the writer to the Hebrews says, by what he suffered. He never sinned, but he also grew in his obedience. He grew in his character. Jesus was not just, the moment he was born, uh, he was singing the Psalter. He learned the Psalms from Mary and Joseph. And it's the Holy Spirit who taught him. The Holy Spirit drove Jesus out for his trial. Uh, the, the actual verb there is to cast out like a ship, to launch a ship. The Holy Spirit, the first act of Jesus' ministry, the Holy Spirit launches Jesus like a ship. It's like he grabs him by the arm and hurls him into the wilderness to fulfill the temptation that Adam forfeited and that Israel failed to to fulfill in the wilderness. Now Jesus, as the last Adam and the true and faithful Israel, is filled with the Spirit and driven out by the Spirit for his trial. And throughout his ministry, Jesus depended on the Spirit. You notice that, uh, you remember what Jesus calls attributing his miracles to Satan. Remember? Blasphemy against the divinity of Christ. Right? No. What is it? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If I cast out demons by the finger of God, and the finger of God referred to the Holy Spirit, the finger of God, uh, the, 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 uh, the magicians of Pharaoh said, surely these, uh, 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 these judgments on Egypt are the result of the finger of God. And then the finger of God wrote the Ten Commandments at Sinai. And Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom has come. You see, he's, he's performing his mission in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not as if he's turning on his divine nature like a light, a binary switch. You know, when he's, when he's triumphing over the devil, he turns on his, his divine shield. And then when he says he's hungry or he's thirsty, it's because he's flipped it to the human, humanity switch. It's a heresy called Nestorianism, in case you, you're interested. No, it's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because it is by the Holy Spirit that he is fulfilling his mission. So this is all, a, this is a long introduction, <laughs> very long introduction uh, to uh, Jesus' upper room discourse, sometimes also called his farewell discourse because that's really the purpose of his, uh, of his instruction. And as we'll see, this passage tells us an awful lot about where we are in redemptive history. It tells us an awful lot about the tension uh, of, that we live in right now at that intersection between this present age and the age to come where those two ages are colliding. And one of the places we see that, see that really clearly is in the Eucharist. I'll talk about finally tomorrow. What does all of this have to do with the Eucharist? Plenty. And the first thing it has to do uh, with the Eucharist is that this sermon was given when Jesus instituted it. Now you don't get that from John's gospel because John is the only gospel that leaves out uh, the uh, institution of the Lord's Supper and instead focuses on what Jesus did with the foot washing, which also testified to, was a sort of working, living parable of what he was going to accomplish on the cross and in the resurrection. Uh, and so you go to the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you realize this is what was happening at the same time he was teaching it. So in other words, what I'm about to kind of unpack a little bit in the time we have remaining here is Jesus' sermon that he gave when he instituted the Lord's Supper. So the word and sacrament there in that upper room as he was preparing his disciples for his departure. And here in this discourse, as we'll see, the judicial and transformative aspects of the Holy Spirit's uh, operations converge. 
Jesus impresses on his hearers in this sermon that his departure is a net gain. It is actually a net gain that I leave. We have to have Jesus Christ enfleshed in our humanity as our representative at the Father's right hand, securing our resurrection and glorification on the last day. And we need him there mediating and interceding for us at the Father's right hand. I mean, that's the important courtroom. The important courtroom, as serious as it is, the important courtroom is not here below where there's martyrdom, where there is persecution, where there is opposition to the kingdom of Christ. The, the real threat to all of us here is not what human beings can do to us. The real threat is the heavenly courtroom when Satan is roaming freely as our prosecutor because he's a good lawyer and he has a really good case. And so Christ has cast him out of the heavenly courtroom. We need him up there doing that. We needed him to go up and throw him down so that now the worst thing that can happen is he can, he can incite uh, people to persecute us sort of be his emissaries to persecute. Ah, that's horrible. That's terrible. And it's easy for those of us uh, from cushy countries to, to talk about that. It is horrible. But it is not the end of the world. The end of the world would be Satan still in that courtroom. Jesus Christ has thrown him out, cast him out of the heavenly courtroom. It's only his, his days are numbered now. And that's why he's angry. Revelation 12. He's raging because he knows his time is short. But we also need the Holy Spirit to accomplish, only, uh, to accomplish what only he can. Okay? We need the Son in our flesh, the incarnate Son at the Father's right hand in heaven, but we need the Holy Spirit here on earth to do what the Holy Spirit alone can do. The Holy Spirit is the completer of the Trinity the one who completes, who perfects all of the works of the Father in the Son. We need Him now to work within us to bring us to repentance and faith so that we will be united to this Christ who intercedes for us at the Father's right hand. So before His ascension, Jesus tells the disciples, wait in Jerusalem for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. In just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Remember, they asked that question right at his ascension. Now is it the time you're going to restore your kingdom to Israel? And what is Jesus' answer? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get it yet. Uh, here, okay. Mm, never mind. Okay, I, I told you about the Holy Spirit in the upper room. But you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand it. It's not going to, it's going to have an aha moment on Pentecost. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Can you just do this for me? Just be really quiet. Don't talk to reporters. Just go to the upper room, that same upper room, lock yourselves in there, take a cot, whatever, sleep until Pentecost comes. Just try not to make trouble. Uh, have people slip meals in under the door if you need to, whatever. Just don't talk to anybody. You're going to give really horrible theology between now and Pentecost. Just wait until the Holy Spirit comes, and He will empower you to be my witnesses. They can't follow Him now to where He's going. They want to, but they will be united to Jesus after His ascension in a new yet even more intimate way after Pentecost than they had ever been when they were sleeping on cots together and eating fish together. The Spirit will unite them to Christ like branches to a vine, not as friends to their master, but as little brothers and sisters to the big brother, as branches to the vine, as members of the body to the head. Because of his work, they will be able truly to eat his flesh and drink his blood unto eternal life, as he promised 
in chapter 6. You did not choose me, he says in this sermon, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. I, appo I appointed that too. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. And the fruit is love, particularly the love that we have for each other in the communion of saints because we are loved and chosen in Him. There'll be a new family around which a new humanity will grow. So the Holy Spirit is the answer to the anxiety about Jesus' departure. Why would Jesus desert? We have to, we have to appreciate the astonishment of the disciples at this point. They're thinking in terms of is a replay of Israel's history. Every, every uh, devout Jew thought in terms of exodus, conquest, rest in the land. Exodus, conquest, rest. The distribution of the land to the 12, tr to the 12 tribes. So when Messiah comes, all of that will just re be replayed. Right? We're going to go back. Now, i got to say without, uh, this is where my grandma says you stop preaching and gone to Medlin, but there are a lot of Americans um, who think pretty much along those lines. It's going to be a replay. They're expecting the end times to be a replay of that Sinai covenant. So they're sending money to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and so on and so, so forth. We're going to tear the book of Hebrews, evidently, out of our canon and, and go back to Leviticus. Uh, and uh, Israel is going to be a geopolitical kingdom of God on earth again. That's exactly the way they were thinking, and that's why they asked the question before the ascension, now is it the time that you're going, why? Because they, finally they got, when they're walking along the road, the two disciples are walking alo along the road to Emmaus with Jesus. And they say, we thought he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, not knowing that they were talking to Jesus. They were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said, oh, you're so thick. <laughs> Bless your hearts. Uh, and starting with Moses and the law, he showed them how everything in, 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 in the law and the prophets was about him. And their hearts burned within them as he opened up the scriptures uh, along the road. So now they're beginning to get this is a far larger exodus than we had ever imagined. This is not the exodus of merely one ethnic group from bondage and slavery to the Roman Empire. You're talking, you have, you're the new Moses leading us through the watery death that is common to all human beings. You're taking away death. So they understood now the exodus with Christ as the central character, but they didn't yet understand the conquest with Christ at the center. They were still thinking in terms of Joshua leading us into the promised land. All right, that was great. The exodus, terrific. Blows my mind. This is so much bigger than what happened in the Old Testament. But now what about Caesar and the Roman Empire and so forth? Now, surely, we're going to get them off our backs, and this is going to be great. And uh, Jesus said, no, it's a conquest by the Holy Spirit, not by driving them out with swords, but by, dry, by, by conquering the world through the gospel, the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit. Go and wait for the Holy Spirit, and, and He will come to you. And so really what the book of Acts is, is another conquest story. But very different from the book of Joshua. It's sort of the New Testament book of Joshua. A and yet, it's very different. The Lord is conquering by His Spirit, whom He has sent from the Father. And so Jesus identifies the Holy Spirit as another Parakletos, another attorney. Now again, most of your translations uh, will uh, typically translate this comforter, whereas the better word is advocate. 
Now there are lots of reasons, there are lots of reasons why uh, people choose comforter. First of all, an advocate does comfort. It's comforting to have a good lawyer when you're in trouble. Um, but there have been a lot of other assumptions that have led some translators uh, in the direction of translating Parakletos uh, comforter here. Origen, the early church father, observed that, quote, in the Greek, Parakletos bears both meanings. Nevertheless, in regard to the Savior, Paraclete seems to mean intercessor. When used of the Holy Spirit, though, the word Paraclete ought to be understood as comforter because he provides comfort to the souls to whom he opens and reveals a consciousness of spiritual knowledge. Well, there's a lot of theological interpretation going on there. Um, though possible, lexically, uh, it isn't uh, in the context, once again, in my view, uh, the best translation. Um, this, this term really is about uh, an advocate in a courtroom. Th this is the way it was used by the rabbis. Uh, here are some quotes from the rabbis. Uh, it's used in contrast, parakletos, used in contrast with an accuser. So the opposite of an accuser is, an, is a defense attorney. Whoever is summoned before the court for capital punishment is saved only by powerful advocates, says one of the rabbis. In fact, in modern Hebrew, paraclet is a defense attorney. And furthermore, in uh, 1 John 2, 1, Parakletos is translated uh, there in relation to Jesus, advocate. So why not here? Why is it the Holy Spirit, Parakletos, advocate here? I think part of it is because we're trying to see a difference between the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Jesus is our advocate, but the Holy Spirit is our comforter. But that is making the distinction at the wrong point. I believe. What Jesus is saying here is that the Holy Spirit is, is as much a lawyer as he is. I am sending Allos Parakletos, another lawyer, <laughs> not someone who isn't an attorney. I'm sending a different attorney. I'm going to be your attorney at the right hand of the Father, but you need an attorney to win the trial in your heart, to convince you and persuade you of your guilt, and to bring you to repentance and faith. Without that, without that, you will be lost. You will be condemned. Now, all of this is provoked by uh, Jesus' institution of the, of the Lord's Supper, uh, the Last Supper, as I mentioned. And, and the questions that Jesus answers are provoked, first of all, especially by Jesus' announcement of his departure. Peter asks, now see, again, think, think in, in terms of the Jewish story. The exodus has passed. Now you're ready for the conquest, and Joshua leaves. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, conquest, Joshua has to be here. And Jesus' name is Joshua, Joshua, you know. He's supposed to be here for this. He can't go home. No, 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 this is where he's like conqueror. Jesus like, you, know, you don't understand, I am conqueror. You need me to conquer from the cockpit. And send the Holy Spirit to conquer on the ground. I, I, I'm going to unpack this for you. But Peter, as usual, really catches on quickly. <laughs> Lord, where are you going? <coughs> Jesus replies, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? Like a puppy. I love Peter because, you know, I'm so thick. And so I just read Peter and I say, oh, great. I, I'm not totally lost. <laughs> I will lay down my life for your sake. Like one more time. Peter, if you say that one more time, I'm going to slap you. <laughs> you're going to lay down your life for me? No, you're going to deny me three times. Big man on campus. I'm going to lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, um, Will you lay down your life for my sake? You don't get it. I'm going to lay my da life down for your sake. Stop getting into the limelight, Peter. Just, this is not about you. This 
is about me, what I'm doing for you. Thomas then also asked, ah, yes, Peter opens up the door for Thomas. Lord, we don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Philip chimes in, well, show us the Father. Wow. I mean, no, you're, no, 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 you're, you're a great hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> but now, show us the Father. Okay, Jesus is now just really kind of, uh, you could tell, fed up with the whole thing. Um, Philip, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me at all? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I and the Father are one. <laughs> wow! And thank goodness, thank goodness the, the disciples didn't get it because every time they don't get it, Jesus teaches us a, just like we get a gold mine right there in front of us. So we hear echoes of the transition from the ministry of Elijah to Elisha. Only now, instead of a double portion that Elisha got from Elijah, Jesus was given the Spirit without measure and gives the Spirit without measure to us. It's a new day dawning, and Jesus says this is exactly what you need to happen. Uh, this is for you. First, Jesus says, there will be the judgment uh, of the world, uh, the judgment of the church. The Holy Spirit will come, and the Holy Spirit will be, bring judgment. Only the Son is bringing judgment in your defense at the Father's right hand in the heavenly courtroom. The Holy Spirit is coming into your is the, your your courtroom of your heart to bring you to the place where you will be convicted of your sin and throw yourself completely. Uh, on the mercy of Christ. We need both attorneys, the one in heaven and the one on earth. So first there's the world's judgment of the church, chapter 16, verse 2. Um, they will falsely accuse Jesus. They will falsely accuse you. You'll be driven out of the synagogues. The world will hate you. And it's interesting that in John's telling of the story here, Jesus was identifying the world with fellow Israelites who were not believing the gospel. The world will hate you. The world will judge you. Actually, it is a sign of the Spirit's presence that the world hates the church. The Holy Spirit is active in creating a church that the world hates. I mean, I don't think we should try really hard to get the world to hate us. But if the church is centered around Christ and His Word in the power of the Holy Spirit, the church will be odd. It will be something the world will try to get rid of because it's such an anomaly. It's, it's so off-putting. It's so strange. Jesus says that He will return to the Father and will send the Spirit of truth Notice the spirit of truth, especially associated here with truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither knows him nor sees him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You know him, you know the Holy Spirit, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Very interesting point that I'll unpack a little bit more tomorrow. There's a qualitative difference between the way the Holy Spirit was with the disciples then and the way He will be with them in that same room at Pentecost. Right now, He dwells with you, but then He will dwell in you. That has never happened in the history of redemption. So there will be a watershed Pentecost will re represent that watershed in the middle of history. And, and so the, the double portion that Elisha received 
of Elijah's spirit is a little Pentecost and, uh, that is, that is uh, just a harbinger, a small foretaste of what we see uh, at Pentecost. So the answer to the disciples' anxious questions is not to downplay the reality of his departure until he returns into the, in the flesh. Rather, it's to promise the Holy Spirit. Notice what Jesus does not say. You know, why are you leaving? Where are you going? Why can't we follow? This is all so enigmatic. What on earth is happening? What are you saying, Jesus? Notice Jesus doesn't come back and say, well, I'll really be with you. You know, kind of like uh, your grandparents are with you at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Sort of, you know, uh, with you. Sort of there looking down. You know, you're all, all these, the, we have all these ways of putting it. Now he's, re, he's really here. He's not really gone. Jesus said, no, I'm really going to be gone. Seriously, no, I'm leaving. Leaving as in, I'm here right now, but I won't be. <laughs> and then the same way I'm leaving bodily, I will return bodily. But there's going to be a, a while there before I return, and in that, in that while, I won't be here on earth. The church is always looking away from Jesus, trying to compensate for Jesus' absence by saying, well, it's not really that Jesus has left because now his divinity is everywhere. Or the Holy Spirit replaced Jesus. No, the Holy Spirit creates the longing for Jesus' return in our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit in our hearts who keeps us longing for Jesus' return in the body. He doesn't replace Jesus. Well, the church, we hear this one a lot, the church replaces Jesus. The church is Christ's ongoing incarnation. Dreadful, heretical idea, actually. That the church is Christ's ongoing incarnation. No, his incar ongoing incarnation is in a seat. <laughs> his ongoing incarnation is his, alone, uniquely. He is at the Father's right hand interceding for us. His ongoing incarnation is in heaven where he's seated at the right hand of the Father. The church is not the incarnation of Jesus. The church isn't Jesus, just as a, as a rule, general rule of thumb. I think we should just all agree it's a, it's a bad thing, generally, to confuse yourself with Jesus. And you hear it all the time today, people talking about, you know, the church is, is sort of the ongoing. Anyway, never mind. I'm not going to keep going with this. But Jesus doesn't say, no, I, it's really good because the church will come. Or it's really good because you're going to have a pope who will be my vicar. Or it's really, it's, it's really okay because there will be this big movement that will make you forget about the loss of me not being here physically. Because it will be my ongoing incarnation. The Holy Spirit will replace me. He doesn't say any of that. He says the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and make it yours. In other words, the Holy Spirit won't compensate for the loss, but the Holy Spirit will unite you here on earth to me in heaven. In fact, in such a way, you disciples won't understand this till Pentecost, but in such a way that you will know me better than you ever have in the flesh. Because you will know me in the Spirit, that is, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just as he came in the spirit of the day to bring judgment in Genesis 3.8, Jesus says he will come to bring judgment to the world. Not just the world's judgment of the church, but judgment to the world. When this other attorney comes, Jesus instructs, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The, the verb for convict here is to expose. You know, he, he'll, he'll be a good lawyer. He will expose in our own hearts the truth about ourselves before a holy God. Satan is judged already. He goes on to argue in verses uh, 10 and uh, 11. And then he will convict the world of sin. 
Now, basically, all that Jesus promises concerning the Holy Spirit actually happened at Pentecost, didn't it? Isn't it amazing? The one thing, the, 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 the sort of, what was this, the main event of Pentecost? It wasn't a healing line. What was the main event of Pentecost? Someone who denied Jesus three times to a little girl is boldly proclaiming Christ from the Old Testament scriptures on the steps of the temple. And as a result of that preaching of the gospel, hundreds of people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that day, that moment. That's why Jesus said, greater things will you do when the Holy Spirit comes than I have done. He's not referring, of course, to the atonement. He's referring to the people who believe. Not many people believed in Jesus during his earthly ministry. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll turn the lights on. The Holy Spirit will turn a house into a home. The Holy Spirit will indwell us. The Holy Spirit will raise us from spiritual death, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And through that external gospel that is proclaimed, the dead will be raised, just as Ezekiel uh, prophet, it was prophesied in Ezekiel uh, chapter 37. All of that happens. Peter prosecutes the case against them. He's the outer attorney, as it were. And the Holy Spirit is the inner attorney, convicting them of what they're hearing. You put him to death. Then he also proclaims God's righteousness, but God raised him from the dead and judgment. It was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then he turns to passages from the Old Testament to announce that Jesus Christ is the one spoken of by the prophets. Now, when they heard this, they were what? They were cut to the heart. See, that's what the Spirit does. He cuts day from night. He cut the waters from the land. The Holy Spirit separated Israel from the nations. That's why Moses said, please don't, don't take away the presence of your Spirit or there will be no distinction between us and the nations. If you're not going to send your presence with us, then don't let us go up out of here. Just kill us now. It's the Holy Spirit who separates and then unites, separates us from everything unholy and then unites us into one body. That's the Holy Spirit's work of separating, dividing, and uniting. And here they are cut to the very heart. He's the spirit of circumcision, cutting, separating. They were cut to the very heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Jesus is smiling, the heavenly attorney is smiling and saying, see, that's what I was talking about. That's what didn't happen in my ministry. I accomplished what the Holy Spirit is now convincing people of as they hear the apostles announcing that message. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so this is the work of the Spirit, even uh, into our own day. Whatever else the Spirit is associated with, the main thing He's associated with is the proclamation of the gospel. Opening hearts to believe what is proclaimed concerning Jesus the Christ from all the scriptures. The Spirit's ministry is not to add anything to Jesus' work, but to remind the disciples of what Jesus has said. Chapter 16, verse 12 of this sermon, Jesus says exactly that. And that's the basis for the New Testament as revealed scripture. This is not generic. This is not written to us. This is not written about us. This is written about the apostles. Jesus is here speaking not to all the Christians of all the ages. He's speaking to the apostles and saying, when the Spirit comes, he will remind you of everything that I have spoken to you directly, immediately, he means. You have stood in my counsel which is the, the, the criterion for a, an apostle. You have stood in the counsel of the Lord, but you must be endowed now with the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will remind you of all this stuff that I've said that you never understood. And he will lead you into all truth, and he will tell you of things to come. He's talking to the apostles, 
and he's giving us the basis for our view of the New Testament as Holy Scripture. And so that is how Jesus answers the disciples' question, where are you going and how can this possibly be a good thing? Whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever that answer is, how could this possibly be a good thing? It has to be good enough to, to account for Jesus leaving. It is good that I go. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit is so important in this, especially in this phase of the campaign of Christ's kingdom. The Holy Spirit is so crucial that Jesus said, it's actually good that I leave because this is his job. His job is to complete the work. His job is to finish things. His job is to apply it to hearts. His job is to spread out his wings over the darkness and void, spiritual death, and to bring life. And all of this will happen because I will leave. And if I leave, I will send the Spirit my Father promised. So we can be absolutely sure where the Holy Spirit is and where He is uh, uh, at work powerfully anywhere in the world, wherever Christ is proclaimed. Wherever the Holy Spirit is not central, there the Holy Spirit is powerfully at work. Wherever Christ is central, wherever Christ is held up in all His beauty and glory, majesty, and humility as the Savior of sinners, there the Holy Spirit is at work. That's where the Holy Spirit delights to be present. So if, to, to wind this up, in one sense, Jesus is absent. And the church just has to get used to this fact. Jesus really is gone. That's what Jesus is telling the disciples. Seriously, I'm gone. I'm leaving. I'm really gone. And gone doesn't mean sort of here. I'm not. I'm gone. His absence from us in the flesh highlights the difference between Jesus and us. He's at a different place. He's the head. We are the members. But he is the head risen out of the waters of death and glorified. But the rest of the body is not yet. He's at a different place than we are. He's glorified and we're not. And yet, there's a real presence. A real presence. Not because Jesus comes down, returns bodily to the earth at the ringing of a bell. That the church can summon him, can, can require the parousia by its actions but rather because Christ has promised His Spirit who will take what belongs to Him and make it our common possession. The Holy Spirit is the one who unites us to Christ, and that's why Jesus can say, I will not leave you as orphans. Don't worry. I will come to you. What? You just said you're leaving. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. What happened to me has to happen to you. Yet, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. They will know Jesus no longer simply as a unique individual and a friend along the way. They will know Jesus, very importantly, not merely as an example they are to follow. They will know Jesus as a vine to whom they are attached as a living branch. They will know Jesus more intimately than they had ever known him before. They will know him as the first fruits of the new creation in whom they have a share. I will come to you, he says, because the Holy Spirit is the one who will take what is mine and make it yours. All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for 
the promise uh, that you made of sending your Holy Spirit, and we thank you for sending your Son, who accomplished everything as the ground for our deliverance, for our exodus from sin and death, and thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to actually raise us from that spiritual death and to unite us to your Son, in whom we have all of the blessings of precious inheritance as your adopted children. And help us, Father, to recognize the great turning point that Pentecost represents. Help us to recognize the great significance of our Savior's departure to lead the campaign in heaven where even now he intercedes for us. And the, the double pleasure, the double joy of having the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit by whom he was conceived, be sent into our hearts to indwell us and to make us part of the new creation forever. Hear us for we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.